So uh, my name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the uh, Google Cloud Platform. And um, there are two things I do. Number one, I love to bring some of the latest and greatest technology that Google has to offer uh, to the developers. And the other side of it is that I love to hear about your experiences and how you use our technology today. And if you are not, I love to learn why and also what you're looking to do and uh, any feedback you can have. Uh, I love to hear it as well. The best way to get in touch with me is via Twitter, at Saturnism. And uh, this is my profile picture. I'm kind of shy, so I don't usually show my face. And uh, it, I do it for t one reason, one reason only, uh, because sometimes I don't feel so good. Like, for example, if I didn't make my flight today and not able to get here, I'll just find somebody else and come here and talk about this, and uh, you'll never know it wasn't me. And that's why I do this. <laughs> Okay, and aside from uh, technology, uh, which I've been in for a long time, uh, I love to travel, and I love to take photos, and this is uh, a Flickr uh, site that I have, which has all the travel photos I have. Cool, so I'm going to tell you a little story of myself, and, uh, and then I'm going to talk about the Unicronos and how I got here. So I joined Google about the two and a half years ago. That's how long I have been working at Google. And uh, prior to that, I was in cloud. I was in working at Red Hat. I was working at a big consulting firm before that. I was always doing enterprise architecture, Java-based applications, uh, SOA, uh, many, many years ago. Um, and um, and once I, was, I was at Red Hat, I was doing JBoss and the middleware stuff. Uh, but then I, when I joined Google, uh, they told me, hey, we got this uh, great uh, job for you. It's developer relations. I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do. I, I love to teach uh, developers uh, the things I learned myself. So I said, yeah, let's, let's do this. But then uh, once I joined, I figured out, uh, hold on a second, they put me in the uh, advertisement department. And um, you know, I, I know nothing about advertisement myself. Okay, I knew nothing about it. And um, I had zero interest in advertisement. It's, it's quite a different world. I don't know if anyone's in advertising industry here. No? Yeah, yeah. Well, some people like it, but it wasn't for me. And um, I was able to change your job. It's really, really nice at Google. Like, if you don't like what you do, you can always find another place to go. You can find a new job to, to do. And uh, after one year, I got off of the advertisement job, and uh, I was transferred back into cloud, which is what I do today, uh, which has a lot more to do with uh, what I used to do before, right? Because in, before I was doing, like, on-prem cloud, right? Um, things that you run with VMware and stuff, and then you run your middleware applications on top of that. Uh, now I'm actually doing real cloud um, on Google Cloud Platform. But this is what happened to me. I was in ad for one year. And uh, after that, when I got out, which is like a year and a half, a year and a half ago, I was like, what happened? What are, what are all these new things? What is, what is Docker for that matter? What the hell is Docker? And <laughs> what happened to OpenShift? Because when I was at Red Hat, I was one of the few people who can actually set up OpenShift. I don't know if anyone uses OpenShift or know about OpenShift here. Yeah, a few. Yeah, I, I was the only person who can set up this OpenShift platform as a service on prem by hand manually. And then when I got out, I'm like, what is this Docker thing? I thought, I thought we were all talking about OpenShift when I left uh, Red Hat at the time, when I joined Google. And, um, and uh, what happened to it? What happened to C groups? And what happened to, um, to SE Linux and all of those other things? And why is everyone talking about Docker? Uh, and OpenShift is using this thing called Kubernetes, which, like, what is Kubernetes for that matter? Anybody here know about Kubernetes? Just a few, yeah. I hope there's a session here, but uh, I, I think there's a session here. You should definitely learn about it as well. So things have changed very, very quickly within the one year I was away. Uh, from this whole cloud world. Um, and that was a surprise to me. And, um, and things took off real quick for a reason. Like Docker container is really nice, really easy to use. Uh, and also, um, it helps resolve some of the real problems, like being able to isolate your process in terms of uh, resources and uh, avoid some of the most common problems, such as simple things like poor conflicts. Um, and, and Kubernetes is a really good way for you to orchestrate uh, containers and stuff, right? But then, I caught up with all of these things. I understand a lot of this technology now. And then after another half month or so, I saw this other article, and I thought it was all about containers. And then I thought, what are unikernels? <laughs> Why is everybody talking about that now? Like, I thought I just learned about containers, and what the hell are unikernels? And that's the thing I want to share with you today. Uh, and because I was going through the phase, like, oh my god, there are so many new things. Um, I, I need to learn a little bit more of each one of them and why they're important, and uh, maybe that's where the future is. So anyone here already know about unikernels? 
No? Well, fantastic. Then I can say whatever I want. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so traditional kernel uh, in the operating system, like the one that's running on this MacBook right now, or this one running on this phone, um, right? There are, there, are, there are kernels where you can run multiple processes, and they, they separate things into, say, kernel space memory and user space memory. And um, you can run your modules in kernel space, and then you can run um, your applications in user space. User space. And you can run multiple processes. You can have multiple users running on this operating system at the same time. But that also adds some kind of overhead in some cases, right? Because uh, when you start a Linux server uh, 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 operating system, for example, you boot the kernel. It's trying to load all of the different drivers and modules. Uh, so that takes uh, some time. It's trying to initialize itself. Um, and, um, and then finally drop you into this uh, sys init5 kind of thing so you can start up all sorts of different daemons. Uh, and that will take a, a little bit of time as well. And there are multiple ways to do that. And then finally, they drop you into the shell. And then you finally can start an application process from there. And you can start multiple processes from there. Unikernels are a little bit different, right? They are, they're, they're, kernel, they're operating system kernels. But it's really designed to just run one thing one thing at a time. It is not designed, in most cases, to run a multi-user and multi-process uh, type of workload. So for example, in Unikernel, you don't really have users. You just have, it just boots. It boots, and it runs one thing only, and that one thing is your application. So in a way, the way I think about Unikernels is that uh, it is a kernel, the, the baseline kernel, that's fused with your application. So when this image starts because you have to create the image, right? You have to create this kernel image. You create a kernel image that has the kernel that can boot and that knows how to run your application. It's in this one single image. And because it doesn't have to deal with a lot of the other things, um, so it actually starts really, really fast. It doesn't have to deal with a lot of the driver issues because they're kind of designed to run in a virtualized environment like KVM or like a virtual machine. And with virtual machines, the drivers are almost always the same. So most of these unit kernels, they just implement one type of driver to get to the network. And then because your application is kind of fused into it, as soon as the kernel starts, your application starts as well. So that is very different from the other type of the um, operating system that you were using today. Um, so why is that nice, and why, do I, uh, why am I interested in it? Well, first of all, you have to remember that the containers um, I'm assuming some people here knows about containers, uh, like Docker containers and stuff. Containers are inherently not designed to be a security boundary. Why? Because containers are just processes that's running on the same, uh, the same machine as other processes. If you break out of a container, then you're on the machine directly. That can have access, potentially, to other processes as well. With Unikernels, if you run your application in a VM, then if you break out of your process, you are still blocked in that VM. You cannot get to other VMs. In, uh, it will be very, very hard, extremely difficult to do a, a cross-hypervisor kind of thing to get to another VM. So inherently, if you run a virtual machine, it's going to be uh, more secure uh, between virtual machines. Uh, but then if you run virtual machines uh, the traditional way, you're going to have a lot of overhead in terms of starting off the application, like the, oh, the process I just described to you. So if you run this with a unikernel, then as soon as you start the virtual machine, it will probably take a few seconds for the kernels to start, and then you are in your application, and you're done. Uh, that is the difference. Uh, and these kernel images are typically small. It only has the kernel component and your application. And in, in our case, the demo, uh, I also have the JVM. So rather than having, say, a 5 gigabyte uh, image, you are only going to get, like, say, a 100 megabyte image, because part of that is going to be the JVM. And it's really, really, really fast booting. So, uh, there are quite a few different unikernels that's out there today. Uh, they all are designed for different purposes. Uh, these are just a few things I found uh, when I was doing my own research. Uh, some of the most popular ones, like uh, RumpRun uh, and the OSV, uh, these unikernels, they can uh, compile different languages uh, directly and fuse them into the kernel, so you get this one single image. So for example, you can run, um, uh, say, uh, a C, C++ application that's just fused with the kernel directly. Okay? You don't have to start a separate process. There's no like init5 or anything like that. Uh, and then there's other ones. They all have like a little specialty in terms of the language they support, like Ling and uh, Mirage OS and Runtime.js. So for example, if you write JavaScript applications, if you want to try Unikernel, maybe you should try Runtime.js instead. 
but I love Java. I'm a Java developer. I've been a Java developer for a long time. That's why uh, I wanted to find a unit kernel that actually supports Java and runs Java applications. And the only one out there that does it today, as far as I know, is called OSV. Okay. And so let's do a little uh, demo with OSV. Let me see how much time I have. I have just a few more minutes. Yay. Okay. So um, I'm going to delete this Java file. Hopefully, I can recreate it. <laughs> there we go. That's the original. OK. So over here, let me blow this up. I have a Spring Boot application. Uh, it's written in Groovy. And uh, all this is going to do is to create a Java file. Now, typically, I would actually run this in a container. And to do that, I have a Docker file. And Docker file describes how I'm going to build the application and uh, create the container image. Uh, for Unikernels, for OSV, rather than a Docker file, uh, they actually have another file, which is called the capstan file. Okay? And this is very, very specific to OSV, just so you know. Like, if you use different Unikernels, there are different ways for them to describe how you want to build it. So here, it's pretty straightforward. You also describe a base image, like a base uh, kernel image that you want to use. And then you can keep on adding your application into this thing so you can create this one single image. And, um, and here, this image is actually designed to run Java application. And all I want to do is to build my jar file. And then I want to add my jar file into this unique kernel image. And then this is how I'm going to start it. And remember, it can only run one thing at a time. So it's just going to run the jar. Okay? So let's try it. So I'm going to capstan. Um, let me do the build first. So capstan build. Let me do that. Let's see how the Wi-Fi goes here. OK, so this is actually creating the unique kernel image. Blah. And then it's going to, this is actually putting them into the unique kernel image, fusing them together. And then I have this one image, which is located here. Let me blow this up. So it actually created this uh, the VBox image. And as you can see, it's only about 170 megabytes. That's because there's also the JVM in there. Uh, once you have this image, then you can run it. So I can do capstan. Oh, sorry, capstan run. And I can uh, map the port, just very similar to Docker in this case. I can do capstan run, and then I can map a port. And watch this. This is really cool. It, um, it actually was running an operating system. It started the kernel, but it felt like it, felt like it was just starting a process, didn't it? But it was actually running in a VM. If I go to, uh, in this case, if I go to VirtualBox, um, it's actually here. It's, it's actually running. Let me see here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right there. It's actually running VirtualBox. This is actually running in a VM. And that is Unikernel. Um, you can definitely feel the difference uh, when you compare this with a regular VM. And then you compare this with like a container, it, it would, uh, you'll definitely see the difference. Uh, and then so for me to get to it, all I need to do is to go to localhost 8080. Yeah, of course, I wasn't found because I need to get my thing. There you go. All right, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, the one thing that you can also do then is to, you can run this VM image anywhere. So in many of the, the, the cloud providers, for example, you can actually upload your VM image. And then you can, say, create a group of VMs. And these VMs are all going to start fairly quickly as well. Um, so you don't have to wait for that long boot time for the VMs. Uh, so for example, uh, in Google Cloud Platform, let me go there, uh, what I can do? is to upload this image into the Google Cloud Platform, into what we call the cloud storage, which, which you can store as much data as you want. Uh, but from that image that I created, I can also register it as a VM image. And once I have done that, what I can do is I can go ahead and create an instance. There we go. Uh, and uh, hope this works. Uh, <laughs> and then you can give it the number of uh, the CPUs, for example. And then in many places, you can just choose your image. And here, I can just specify the Hello World service image, which is right here, which I created uh, in the past. And, and that's it. That's all you really need to do. And uh, if I create it, it will just start, hopefully, in a few seconds or so. Now, one thing that you have to remember, one last thing I want to touch on before um, I end this session very quick, is that um, remember, it only runs one process. So it doesn't run SSHD. You cannot SSHD into your machine if you run a Unicron application. You cannot even see the log files. It will be extremely difficult for you to do. <laughs> so uh, for example, what, I, what people do uh, on the VMs is that uh, you actually have to see the serial output. I don't know if anybody used serial output before on a, on a real computer. 
Yeah, with unikernels, because um, it, it would be more difficult to run another daemon, which people can do, actually. Um, but you have to run it within your uh, Java application. That's another threat. Uh, unless you do that, uh, you get to access your uh, <laughs> and you get to access your uh, application log via the serial output. Yeah, I don't know when's the last time anybody ever used it, but uh, this is one of the, I would say, downside. But then again, it will actually allow you to create this immutable image that you get to deploy, and you get to deploy really, really quickly. Um, and it will mostly become stateless because obviously you don't want to stay store state in this unikernel image either. And um, and so for the, your logs, you actually want to be able to stream your log to a log collector instead, right? So it actually makes your architecture, uh, forces you to, to make certain decisions. So I have the application up and running. So if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, I should be able to see it. And uh, that's the last thing I want to show you. Ah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. So if I say hello, and there it is. Woohoo! It actually works. And if I go into the, uh, the image, uh, and if I go see the console, one second, uh, you should be able to see how fast it actually started. Uh, there we go. So the first thing, it just this is the boot sequence, right? Uh, from this very first line to the bottom of this, probably took like less than a second or so. And then it just drops you directly into the JVM, and then you start the application in about 10 to 15 seconds in this case. Okay, so that's all I have. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>